गुरु कृपा के बल नमस्ते एंड वेलकम एवरी वन टू सत्य टूडे सतगुरु श्री मोजी बाबा की So today is the beautiful uh, occasion of Krishna's birthday. Apparently, today. some are saying yesterday, some are saying today. <laughs> That's a very beautiful uh, time to celebrate. But I still feel that the most important uh, way to celebrate it, is to follow what he. pointed to to follow what he pointed to is the most important and his main pointing was to break our ideas of limitation if you look at his entire life and everything that he said in the bhagavad gita one way or the other is trying to take us beyond our limited ideas about this existence may they be limited ideas of good and bad right and wrong time and space birth and death pointing to that which is so beyond a human condition into a greater true self and that is what satsang is all about the discovery of the truth or the company of the truth to come to our true essence which is not just ephemeral it is not something that just will come and go but we find something which is beyond time beyond eternal so look at your conditions look at our condition and see which of those will survive death which idea that you may be holding on to so dearly will survive the death of this mortal body and why death we don't even need to go so far what will survive sleep what will you still have tonight and all this even the sense of being dissolves So the sages have told us that really only that is worth knowing, and if you know that, then everything is known. <laughs> of course, many misunderstand that to mean everything is known in some materialistic sense. But actually, what happens is that we know everything as that. There is no separation. We find the truth, and then we see that everything is the truth, without any distinctions, and that there are no two. That is why this is called advaita, no two, non-duality. So, to our conditions and the way that we are, this discovery is too strange. You see, it can sound too far out. and in a way it is if we are very <coughs> attached to our identity of name and form then to find that which is beyond name and form can sound too much of a project but if life has quizzed that 
identification out of us, at least to a little extent, then we become more open to this. Everybody, is, mostly everybody, starts with trying to make the identity work. How can I make what I believe myself to be work? And if you look at most of most teaching which is available out there, most what is called self-help which is available out there, it's all about trying to make you as an identity work. How to make your belief system work for you. But there are a few who realize that it doesn't work. Because we are faced with the prospect of death. And no matter what you build up in this mortal realm, it is bound to be blown away. And they start yearning for something which is beyond death. So is it possible at all to come to this sort of recognition? It is completely possible here and now. But you can't have it both ways. You can't be attached to your individualistic ideas and still try to use that for some sort of benefit of the... You see, try to use the truths for the benefit of this ego or the individualistic idea that we take ourselves to be. Just like you cannot... You can try. You can try to board a plane with one foot on the ground, but it is not going to be a lot of fun. In the same way, you cannot stick to the idea of being a limited me while trying to discover that which is the eternal self or the timeless self. And it is the letting go which seems to be the more difficult aspect. Although the mind will tell you that it is the recognition of the truth which seems more difficult. It is actually the letting go of the idea of me, which has no real tangible substance, you see? which somehow seems to be more difficult because this is what has been deeply ingrained. This is what is called our conditioning or our tendencies or our vasanas, whatever term we want to use. You see? Is our belief that we are something that we are actually not. And nobody ever finds this anyway, this separation, this individuality. It's like the, the ocean has taken itself to be the wave and deeply conditioned its ideas based on the state of the wave, the highs and the lows, the, the apparent doing and the apparent desire of the wave seems to have become paramount in this play that the ocean is playing. And sometimes all of this play is called the Leela. Especially with Krishna it is called the Leela. So this Leela is so compelling and the interpretation of this life is so compelling that we take ourselves to be, being the ocean we take ourselves to be, the ocean takes itself to be the limited way. And in this Leela, in this play, it seems to have become so attached to the notion of being the limited wave that it is now trying to fit the ocean into the wave rather than trying to see what really is. And that is the struggle of the spiritual seeker. How can I be me, but how can I now be a spiritual me? Not that the me will dissolve and come to spirit, but how can now the me become more spiritual? So, and this sort of desire and intention can lead to a lot of uh, spiritual selfishness. And we were just half joking the other day when I said, suppose that you did your best sadhana, your best spiritual exercises, 
and the rest of the world became enlightened you see everybody had a halo you suddenly opened your eyes and everybody had a halo and you were very expectant that you will have one too but you went to the mirror and you saw that you are the only one who doesn't have is it will you be happy because you discovered that there is no individual me or did you feel that my sadhana did not work so is the discovery of being ego less or empty of the me supposed to help this me and if it's not supposed to help this me then who is it supposed to help what is it that we are in this for are we in this for the discovery that i am not the body mind so that me as the body mind can be helped so to be empty of this what's in it for me maha mantra of the ego for one moment is to come to the recognition of the ultimate truth or reality to be empty of this expectation of what the truth must do for me or change my life is to meet the truth it is as simple as that if you empty of having to think about it empty of a desire for some great spiritual experience and especially empty of what's in it for me then what remains is the truth what is apparent to you right now is the truth and the truth is not separating itself into the manifest and the unmanifest is the saguna and the nirguna it has no distinction even between appearance or reality even between truth and false so that truth that we are speaking of is beyond the intellectual truth of true and false of right and wrong that which is beyond time beyond space beyond the states of waking sleep and dream that which cannot be contained in any conceptual notion it is not even contained in the greatest vedantic spiritual notion of i am brahman which at best is a beautiful pointer so this is the truth that krishna was pointing to and i feel like we must revere that first before we we can get to the celebration in a while <laughs> he said that that which is real does not come and go it cannot be cut it cannot be harmed and that which is not real has never really existed and this journey will get elongated or prolonged only as long as we are expecting the truth to do something for the false 
expecting the self to do something for the not self. And that is why the emphasis in satsang over the last few days has really been about what is this for? Who is this about? Must the truth help the false? And how can the self help me? If the me is false and the self is true, is it, then is, is it the truth's job to help the false? And this is the most difficult part of this journey, the letting go of what we take to be ourselves, the letting go of our deeply conditioned belief system, where we try to contain everything within our belief system. And who is the term? Uh, they use the term ROI. You see? And if there is no ROI on something, which basically means if there is no what's in it for me is not apparent in something, then it seems like it is pointless. What if it was the other way around? What if the point was to find that which has nothing to do with me? It is so beyond me that the me could not survive it actually. So in that way, if the me is false and satsang means the company of the truth, then we must come to that satsang where there is nothing for this me. But what do we do? We, f we feel that we must go to that satsang where the me is getting the most. And that is symptomatic of the human condition anyway. So, what is that which is beyond concept and perception? Because now many of you of course are advanced seekers, you've been in satsang for a long time, some of you maybe 10 years, 20 years, you've probably read every aspect of spirituality, you see. Buddhism, Zen Buddhism, Vedanta, Christianity, Islam, you read all the Sikhism. Many of you have studied this greatly. And hopefully you come to a similar conclusion that that self or that God or that Absolute that we are looking for is not contained in any concept is beyond any concept and it is beyond any perception or experience. And Krishna has also constantly pointed this out in the Bhagavad Gita. And yet, what does Arjuna say? Show me a great form of yourself so that I can really believe that you are God. Anyway, we won't get into whether Krishna was disappointed or not. <laughs> but let us not disappoint him at this moment. What is this search really about? It must be about something which is beyond our conceptual and intellectual understanding and beyond anything which is perceptual because everything that is perceptual, it comes and goes. So this reality that we are looking for must be beyond coming and going. Because it is this coming and going which is making us suffer. So how do we get to this? 
What I'm really saying is that there is no getting to left. Once you're no longer searching for something which is conceptual or experiential left. When you're no longer searching for anything which is conceptual or experiential, then there is no searching left. But if it seems like there is, Krishna is not. <laughs> then there are many pointers which are available in satsang. One of the simplest pointers is, are you aware now? awareness is going to be the only discovery which is not conceptual or perceptual. It is that simple. And here it doesn't have to be pointed out that this primal witnessing is your own self, beyond your being and not being. Your absolute reality is so simple and original and innocent. Are you aware now? How is this awareness confirmed or known? Is there anything besides itself which confirms itself? Is any confirmation even necessary? If your mind is asking, so what? or what now, it is trying to put the same awareness into the linear story of your individual life. So it's the best if you can forget about so what and what now. Remember that the truth has nothing to do with the faults and it is no guarantee of helping the forms. So don't expect life to change in any way. And this was the, probably the most popular teaching of Krishna, isn't it? Don't worry about the outcome. And yet, what happened to the spiritual seeker? All, every spiritual seeker knows this. And yet, we are constantly worried about the spiritual outcome. Am I free yet? Am I getting it yet? What is most apparent to you?
most apparent. Don't be scared to look at this direction and don't conclude that you already know this. It is apparent even to a child that Okay, let's start in a different place. So, it is apparent to you that you are sitting. What is even more apparent to you? Yeah. I am sitting. So what is even more apparent to you? Breathing. That I am breathing. Okay, what is even more apparent? You can take a intermediary step if you want. So, if I am sitting, then you're, it is apparent that I am. You see? And it is even more apparent, this I, which is before any other condition of amnes. I am this way, I am that way. I am sitting, I am standing, I am a man, I am a woman, I am good, I am bad all these conditions which need this substratum of I amness, the beingness to exist. Is it? So, but the substratum is more apparent, it is more simple. And there is a substratum beyond even this substratum of beingness. Which is the true self. It can never be forgotten or remember it just is it can never be found or lost it just is that's why all the sages have said that the diamond is already in your pocket You're already sitting on the treasure chest, begging for morsels. Because really, we have not looked, we have hardly ever looked in this direction of before I am. We've only been concerned with what is after I am. But the instant you've turned to what is before I am, it is apparent. Now if you don't try to fit this into any idea which is after I am, then there is no trouble ever. In fact, there is no time, so we can't even say ever. This awareness, this I, this self, this absolute, which is the substratum of every state that you ever experience. It is the substratum of sleep, waking, dream, never coming and going. It is you, it is your own self. Like we were saying yesterday, this sense of being, the sense I am, is a portal which goes both ways. It's like a gate, you can travel outside, let's use provisionally the term outside, which means everything that we can attach to the sense I am. You see? I am awake, I am existent, I am a person, I am good. I am a man, I am a woman, I am doing well, I am doing badly, I am happy, I am unhappy. So this is the portal going outwards and we attach ideas to it. 
This is called the ego. Bhagavan Sri Ramana Maharishi said, the notion I am something is the root of all troubles. And this something is like the variable which you can fit anything into. But what about the portal going the other way? Not attaching anything after I am, but just looking for which is the I, which is am, which I is existent now, which I is being. This is a rare contemplation. Because in this Leela, in this play, that which comes after being seems to be very compelling. We seem to be wanting particular states, we seem to be hankering after happiness, joy, even peace. But that which is before I am, to the mind seems pointless. That is why it is a rare contemplation. What is the point of the formless? All of us know that God is formless. So, the formless is being pointed to in this contemplation, isn't it? What is before I am? Because after I am is all concept and form. Now, what is the point of the discovery of something formless? Does it have to have a point in the level of form? So, I have now discovered the formless. So now, in the level of form, I am very happy. This is the main marketing of spirituality. Come to the discovery of the formless, so that now in form you can be very happy. You can really stop suffering. But unfortunately, it is this marketing which seems to serve us initially. But at the end, even this as to this expectation has to be thrown away. Because as most of you know the cat story now, this is what keeps us in the cat identity, wanting to be a free cat, rather than being free from the cat. So the idea that the formulas must mean something for me in the level of form, is one of the final notions that needs to be dropped away. Because otherwise what will happen is, where is my bliss? I was promised Satchivananda. Where is my Ananda? I was told that life will become perfect, but my partner is still fighting with me. My job still has troubles, there is never enough money in the bank. So, these conditions, if you apply to the self, then the journey seems to be endless. We are still being selfish, only we are being selfish spiritually now. Expecting the self to solve all our materialistic problems. So we try to explain to most people, like I met some other parents when I went to drop my son to university and they asked me about satsang. I realize it's a very difficult conversation to have. <laughs> because, because the question then becomes so, but what is the point? of self-inquiry. What will you get if you discover the self? And it is a, but you just find that there you, you are not this you. 
then how does that help me is the question that remains. And I couldn't really point out to these parents who I just met that this is what I am calling spiritual selfishness these days. But the discovery of the spirit or the discovery of God or the self must help the false me. Is the affliction of the spiritual seeker. That's why we use the term truth for truth's sake. Is the truth not worth it for itself? Or you, would you prefer a lie? Even if the lie promised utopia to you, full of ananda, no problem in any four spheres of your human existence, relationship, money, health of the body, and search for meaning. Sometimes we call it the matrix uh, conundrum. It's the same thing. So, if you could find a way to lie to yourself and come to a utopian life, would you pick that? How would you still pick a truth which has nothing to offer you or what you take yourself to be? And the point is not that I am sitting here on a pedestal going to make a judgment about you. No, it's not that. But at least looking this way, you can have integrity because most of you say I just want the truth. Okay. I think we had this conversation. We had this conversation. You asked a similar question. Is it, uh, is it possible what you were saying that you can have an utopian life yeah. without any problems and yeah. based on a life? Yeah. Is that possible? Suppose it was, what would you pick? That is the point. In a way, all of us know that it doesn't it doesn't work out that way. You see, the truth, the false, always leads to some suffering. That is uh, that is clear. But suppose Krishna came and today he said that condition is gone. The false will lead to, to utopia. Would you pick it? That's not true. Yeah, but suppose <laughs> <laughs> it is consciousness which is defined in that way. You no, know? let's say provisionally, all things are possible for consciousness. You see. But if consciousness in the form of Krishna said, I'm so happy with the way you sung, you sung Krishna Ashtakam today. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I'm so happy with the ones who didn't sing today. <laughs> that you, you can get a utopian life, you don't have to find the truth. It's not my experience. Yeah, but now he's telling you I can make it your experience. Would you pick that or would you pick the truth? Again, it's not a judgment. Wouldn't you have to know that this, this was false? I mean, at some level, I would have to know that this is false. No, that is he's telling you already, that it is false. Is false. <laughs> it's like the same yeah. Matrix conundrum. Yeah. There's a guy in the Matrix, some of you have seen, most of you have seen the movie, where he says that I know it's a program, it's a computer program, but I can still taste this wine and eat this steak. Over the versions of it, uh, that it is very... Uh, is an utopian life. You yeah. have experienced and it has not worked. Yeah. But now it will work because Krishna is telling you. Would you pick that it? That time also he was telling you. Ah, no, he's never <laughs> told you. Buddha had everything. All sages. Buddha said the world is suffering. No, for him he had everything. The utopian yeah. life. Yeah. He had everything. Yeah. And yet but now you could have ananda also. Like you could be very satisfied also with the false leela. And how would you pick the truth? That's what I'm asking. Because 
unless there is a delusionment with the the promise of this false yeah. and you know it to be false and yeah. so you know it doesn't work and yeah. see you can't be yeah. So that what made you come to spirituality. Yes. Now, suppose there is a final gate is it, in spirituality. So, uh, let me use the story of the Katha Upanishad. In the Katha Upanishad, there is a little boy Nachiketa who says that I want to discover this truth or the self which is beyond death. Is it? Then death comes to him and he says, to death, show me that which is beyond death. And death says, yes, yes, okay, you can have that, but you have another option. I can give you the perfect life. You will have everything that you ever desire. Everything that you ever desire. So, and you little boy, enjoy yourself with these things. Why would you want this deathless reality? You see? So, in a way, all spiritual seekers come to this point. Come to this point. Where they have to say, Am I in this to help myself? Even if what was offered to myself was the most utopian life which could be available to experience. Or do I really want something which is beyond all these appearances? Even if it was not about suffering and not suffering, which admittedly brought us to spirituality. But in the final gate, if it was asked, that if I can give you something which you know in your heart is false, but you will be you will have a satisfied life, no struggle. Or would you pick that which is truth? And now there's a special condition to this truth now unlike all the spiritual marketing, which is it nothing has to change for your life or will change for your life. But will you be aware of the truth? You will be aware of the truth. Yes. Speak the truth. The truth. So if it is truth for truth's sake, you see, then you will not ask yourself all the objections which the mind comes up with. In fact, to go beyond what he is saying, not only will you be aware of the truth, you, see, you will be aware that you are this awareness itself. As Bhagavan Ramana Maharishi said, awareness is you, awareness is just another name for you. you see. But not in the way that the word awareness sometimes is used also in a worldly way. Or maybe it was designed actually to be used in the worldly way, we have co-opted it to be used in the spiritual way, <laughs> which is that, do, will, I, will I know it conceptually or will I know it as an experience? You will know it, but it will be beyond any conceptual or experiential knowing. And for a while initially it may sound a bit strange to you, because uh, maybe you have not heard it this way before. That. And you may think that the only way to know things is through concept or through perceptual experience. <coughs> but the discovery of the self, the coming to self-awareness, is neither of these, is beyond both of these. And that's what makes it the simplest and the most difficult. Simplest for you in reality, but most difficult for you if you're trying to get it as the mind. What is that knowing which doesn't need any concept? What is that knowing which doesn't need any perception? Independent of whatever you think you know, and independent of any experience that you have perceived, there is a greater knowledge 
which is called self knowledge or atma gyan and it is more direct than even what is usually called experience that experience which is beyond even perception and this is to be reading that it is fully fully available to everyone for satsang or million satsang doesn't matter the simplest discovery that you can make that which is more obvious than the most obvious the truth is that apparent beyond hidden in plain sight it just is isness just is coming to this discovery as part of this leela or play just have to notice that your mind will attack you in all kinds of ways it will attack your ideas about yourself it will attack the voice which is speaking these words it will attack uh, your sangha it will attack everything that it can use to try and distract you away from the simplicity of this you don't have to try and change your mind just don't mind because if you mind then you back to believing yourself to be something the self knowledge is to come to self knowledge is to come to a freedom from the known from what we think we know if you want to make the self an object of your knowing or even the subject of your knowing it's going to seem illusive if you return to the innocence of a child if you come to the beginner's mind as the zen masters call it simple
भजन गाए Dear Father, anything that I try with our mind will not be of any help in discovering myself. Good. But do I need my mind's help to go beyond the mind? No. I know it's contradictory, but negating everything or allowing things to be that comes up is also a mind activity. You see? But right now, Before the sound is a click, you don't need any mind. In a way, what you're saying is right. You need the intellect to negate, not this, not this, come to a niti niti. So, in a way, the highest the intellect can come to that is to say that this is not an intellectual endeavor. You see? But once that is understood, then to try and intellectualize it or to be mindy about it. You see? They don't really keep us stuck. You see? So in the mind, the highest we can come to that is that it's not about the mind, it is beyond the mind. In the intellect we can say it is not it is beyond mind, the reasoning capacity. You cannot reason your way to this. But after that is understood then we don't need to keep saying not this, not this, not this, not this. Just let the mind come and go. Just let all intellectual truth values, yes and no, right and wrong, come and go. And the truth is the most original, the substratum of all of this. that which is aware of the coming and going of the mind. That cannot be lost, it just is. So, if you are using the definition of mind as mind being the bundle of thoughts, then no thought is needed for this discovery of that which witnesses all thoughts, which is aware of all perception. Krishna Govinda, 
Murli Krishna Gopala Mukund Krishna Govinda Murli Krishna Gopala Nanda Nanda Ananda Nanda Nanda Govinda Nanda Nanda Gopala Gopala Nanda Nanda Ananda Nanda Nanda Govinda Nanda Nanda Gopala Gopala Nanda Nanda Ananda Nanda Nanda Govinda Nanda Nanda Gopala Gopala Nanda Nanda Ananda Nanda Nanda Govinda Nanda Nanda Gopala Gopala Nanda Nanda Ananda Nanda Nanda Govinda Nanda Nanda Gopala Nanda Nanda Gopala Krishna Govind, Govind, Gopala Krishna Govind, Govind, Gopala Krishna Govind, Govind, Gopala Krishna Govind, Govind, Gopala Jaya Murali Manohar Nanda Lala Jaya Murali Manohar Nanda Lala Krishna Govind Govind Gopala Krishna Govind Govind Gopala Krishna Govind Govind Gopala Krishna Govind Govind Gopala Jaya Murali Manohar Nanda Lala Jaya Murali Manohar Nanda Lala Krishna Govind Krishna Govind Govind Gopala Jaya Murali Manohar Nanda Lala Jaya Murali Manohar Nanda Lala Krishna Govind Govind Gopala Krishna Govind Govind Gopala Krishna Govind Govind Gopala Krishna Govind Govind Gopala Jaya Murali Manohar Nanda Lala Jaya Murali Manohar Nanda Lala 
Krishna Govinda Govinda Gopala Krishna Govinda Govinda Gopala Krishna Govinda Govinda Gopala Krishna Govinda Govinda Gopala Jaya Murari Mano Haranandala Jaya Murari Mano Haranandala Krishna Govinda Govinda Gopala Krishna Govinda Govinda Gopala Krishna Govinda Govinda Gopala Krishna Govinda Govinda Gopala Jaya Murari Mano Haranandala Jaya Murari Mano Haranandala Krishna Govinda Govinda Gopala
ಪೀತಾಮೃತ ಮೇಡಿವಾಯು ಹೃದಯಾನಂದ ಮೇಡಿವಾಯು ಶಿಲಂಗ ಕಟಿ ಓಡಿ ಓಡಿ ಬಾಯು ಎಲ್ಲಿ ತಮರ ಕನ್ನಾಡಿ ಆಡಿ ಬಾಯು ಚಮರ ಕನ್ನಾಡಿ ಆಡಿ ಬಾಯು ಎಲ್ಲಿ ತಮರ ಕನ್ನಾಡಿ ಆಡಿ ಬಾಯು ಚಿತೋರಾಯೋರ ಗೋವಿಂದ ರಾಧೆ ರಾಧೆ 